You know, I, I think we have a tendency as uh, modern readers of the Bible to look at the characters in the Bible and think that they were um, saints, as it were. They were, um, they didn't have to cut their toenails. They didn't have sleepless nights. They didn't uh, worry about tomorrow. We, we, we somehow put them up here on some kind of mantle or shelf or pedestal thinking they didn't struggle with the same things that you and I struggle with. I assure you, they were. They did. They were human. They were just like each of us. They had clay feet and broken spirits and were looking for hope and for a reason to go on. Um, I, I'm about to read a passage of scripture that is so familiar probably half of the people in the room could decide it without even having it up on the screen. But today I want you to try really hard to hear that scripture as if you were married. Try to put down and put aside and, and put on the shelf the 21st century perspective and reference point and put yourself in a dusty agricultural town in the middle of nowhere at the corner of the Roman Empire where nothing important ever happens. And you're a little 14-year-old girl who's done everything you're supposed to do for 14 years. And an angel shows up. Here now we're through the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement. The reason she was perplexed is the greeting he gave her was one that you give to royalty, to kings and queens. What in the world is he addressing a 14-year-old virgin girl in a hick town as a queen? She was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation that was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall, shake, shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Were we able to go there? Were we able to listen to that as a 14-year-old girl with no education in other than scripture in a small town? I am sure that throughout her 14 years, uh, Mary was was aware of the prophecies of the Messiah. I'm sure that she heard her mother or her relatives or her neighbors or Elizabeth or Zacharias talking about the Messiah and what was going to happen and how it was all going to come about. I'm sure she speculated with her mother and the girls in the village. I wonder what the mother of Jesus would look like and the mother of, of uh, the Messiah. There are a lot of things that we speculate about over the course of our lives. I, for instance, have speculated whether the Cleveland Browns would ever get to the Super Bowl or not, whether they would ever have a franchise quarterback or not, and I, that is something very desirable to me, but it's, it's, a, it's a long shot. It's probably not going to happen. Highly unlikely. The thought that an egotistical, self-made, Loudmouth businessman from New York would make fun of every candidate he ran across as he campaigned for president and still ended up being president is highly unlikely, desirable to some, but highly unlikely. 
the idea that some British radicals would get angry at their relationship with the European uh, uh, Union and to make enough noise that they would end up causing England to separate itself from the Europeans. That's desirable to some, but highly unlikely. Little Jewish girls and their moms talk about the possibility of becoming the mother and the grandfather of the Messiah, and that would be very desirable, but highly unlikely. And yet here stands the second most powerful entity in the known universe saying to this little 14-year-old girl, guess what? You won the Messiah lottery. You are going to be the mother of God. He tells her five things, six things that I think are worth noting. He says, one, you have found favor with God. Two, you're going to be miraculously pregnant. Three, this child is God's son. Four, I'm giving you, God is giving you my son, and he is going to end up being, inheriting the throne of David. <coughs> number five, he's going to be ruler over the house of Jacob forever. And number six, his kingdom will have no end. Wouldn't your head be spinning right about now? I mean, uh, church history says that Gabriel was nine feet tall. Okay? Whether that's true or not, where that comes from, I have no clue. But I was taught that in seminary, and that's part of a church Christian, um, I don't know what, folklore if you want. Okay? So, and, and, and we know as... as Human beings of generations have gone on and on that people have gotten taller and people have gotten bigger. You know, I'm being a football nut that I am. When I was young watching television, there was one 300 pounder in all the football, in all the professional football. Big something, I can't remember the name. Now, I'm sure that, that, that Mary was probably about that high. And she's staring at a nine foot. Beautiful, handsome, huge muscles, like an NFL linebacker, saying, you're going to carry, you're going to be born, you're going to give birth to God's son. What could she have thought? What could she have felt? And of course, she didn't question the reality of the angel. She didn't question the reality of the event. She only said, how's that going to happen? You know, because I mean, boys have to sleep with girls and and I'm a son of that boy. Nothing is impossible with God, says the angel. All right. I want to take a peek behind the scenes and try to figure out what kind of a woman Mary was. And from that, what can we learn about Mary's relationship with Jesus that might be of value to us? I stress to you that this season is a season of relationships, of, of raising our awareness and our understanding of what it means to be related to Jesus Christ and what it means to share that with the relationships around us. What about Mary can we learn about our relationships? And to find the answer to that, we need to look at the five passages in New Testament that give us any information at all about Mary. All right? So we're going to look very briefly at those five passages. The first group is called the Infancy Narratives. It talks about, the, like this one that we just read. The second one is the wedding in Cana. The third one is uh, an incident where she and her other children came to visit Jesus while he was teaching. The fourth scene is at the cross, and the last scene is at the last, uh, in the upper room after the crucifixion. All right, here we go. First of all, as we share this information, I'd like you to consider this thought. This is just sort of a background thought. How did Luke come to know all the things that he wrote in his gospel? You know, he, he's the one to tell it, that we read the traditional Christmas story. He tells us all these details, all these inside pieces of information. How did Luke know that Luke wasn't there? <clears throat> um, how did, who was present when the angel visited Mary? Who was present when Mary visited Elizabeth? Who was present when the innkeeper told Mary and Joseph there wasn't any room at the inn? Who was present in the stable when the shepherds showed up and the wise men showed up? There's only one person that's common to all of us. That's Mary. Luke says at the beginning of his, of his letter, he said, I'm going to do a thorough research of everything so that when you know, I'm telling you the truth. And so he interviews Mary. It includes Mary's story as he packs, unpacks the story of Jesus. 
Now, there's five things about Mary that I want to emphasize, and I think we can learn something from each of these. Number one, she was well-versed in the Old Testament. We know that from a large... I'm not going to go into detail because the clock has taken them along. But she was well-versed, and she knew the Messiah prophecies. She knew the Old Testament. Number two, it says that she found favor with God. Would an outright habitual sinner have found favor with God? Had to be a pretty faithful, righteous, <clears throat> pious young lady. Number three, she was humble. And it says, okay, this is what you want. I'll do what you want. Number four, she was quiet. Number five, she had great self-control. Number four, she had great self-control. Number five, she really didn't understand what was going on. And how do we know that she didn't understand? Because she's always assuming the Jewish teaching that the Messiah is going to be a warrior king. Everything she talks to Jesus, every encounter she has, everything is from the perspective of, well, sooner or later, he's got to show his hand. You know? Pretty soon he's going to declare his kingship. We know that um, <clears throat> when he, they went to a wedding, you know, Jesus was invited to this wedding because he was Mary's son. They show up at this wedding, and Mary's a close relative or, or friend of the person giving the reception. And in the course of giving the reception, they run out of wine. And Mary doesn't want her friend to be embarrassed. That's the worst embarrassment possible. Having a party and running out of the liquids. You know, wow. So Mary goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my friend's about running out of wine. Do something. And what does he say to her? Do you remember? I didn't read the passage, but it ain't my time yet, Mom. Ain't my time yet. Mom says, please, do it anyway. She didn't understand. So he does what she asks. He turns the water into wine. And then the next time, uh, she, she and the, now he's an adult. And he's out teaching. And she wants a moment of his time to talk to him about something. I don't know, tell him what dinner is. I have no idea. But she wants a minute of his time. So she and the siblings that are born after Jesus show up at a place where he's teaching out in public. And she sends word through the crowd to Jesus' way up front. And somebody says to him, hey, your mom and your brothers are here. They need to talk to you. He said, who are my mother and my brothers? It is those who faithfully follow me and serve me that are my mother and my brothers. It wasn't ordinary. It was something special. And she failed to understand that. Uh, I don't even think she understood the crucifixion. What could be more painful than standing at the bottom of the cross watching your son be punished for something he didn't do? And knowing that he had the power to change water into wine the power to heal people, the power to raise Lazarus from the dead, the power to calm storms. Why didn't he do something? Why doesn't he come down off the cross? Doesn't he love me? Can you imagine, Moss, standing there watching your child die in front of your eyes, knowing he has the power to do whatever he wants, and he won't do it, and you don't understand why? Why has he declared himself king? Now's the time. There are some universal lessons to this passage in, in Jesus' or, or Mary's relationship with his mother. I kind of want to hook her star to Joseph's and what I was teaching last week as we unpack this. So I, I taught last week that Joseph laid the foundation for Jesus' faith. Joseph taught him about God and taught him about what it meant to be a good Jew and taught him the scriptures. But who do you think told Jesus he was God's son? Is it more logical that his earthly stepfather would bring up that conversation? Or is it more logically that his mother would bring up that conversation? Somebody at some point had to say to Jesus, Son, you aren't ordinary. You are not ordinary. And I'm sure that Mary, all those hours of holding that baby, and singing to him and comforting him. I'm sure she told him stories. <coughs> our firstborn son, as uh, we have many, many stories to tell about our firstborn. His name is Seth. I told you that thing. <coughs> and and I, I admit to you publicly that I am a Buckeyes fan and a college football nut. And Seth was born on November the 14th. And the last Saturday of November is traditionally the Ohio State Michigan game which is the most important game of the year, in case you don't know that. And on, in September, in November of 1976, 
when Ohio State played Michigan, Seth was two weeks old, and Michigan won. And there was a blizzard outside. And I was very young, I was very passionate in all the wrong ways. I was 25 years old, I was furious. I wanted to break furniture. I wanted to punch holes in the walls. I was that angry, right, Pam? And so I needed to go for a walk. And Pam said, okay, I'll go with you. We have a two-week-old son. It's a blizzard outside. I packed the son into a backpack, wrapped him up in clothes, buried him so there's no way, and walk around the block, and around the block until I burn up all of that adrenaline. We tease Seth that that's how come he's all messed up. <laughs> he was out in that blizzard forever. That also explains why he's an Ohio State fan. How many times as we grew up, Seth, we're sitting in the chair right now. He rolls his eyes and goes, oh, I have to listen to that story again. We told him all kinds of stories, that one in particular. How much more likely is it that Mary told Jesus over and over? There was a night when Gabriel came, and he said, and you are. And I never slept with anybody. How many times did she tell him that story? Until Jesus began to have the belief in his heart he was the Son of God. Joseph teaches him what it means to be a Jew. Joseph teaches him what it means to believe in God. Joseph teaches him what it means to follow God. Mary teaches him he's the Son of God. Whole different ballgame. Mary teaches him he's special. Do you understand that your children need to know that they are special? Do you know that your grandchildren need to know that they are special? It is on us parents and grandparents to convey to our children and our grandchildren they are a once in forever occurrence. There is no one ever going to be anywhere close to them, ever. They are a unique accident of cosmic forces or a creation of God. Mary tells Jesus, you are something special. Someone needs to tell our loved ones that they are something special. I think that's the first universal lesson. Second thing that Mary influenced or her relationship influenced Jesus was the nurturing of his faith. I think, I think Joseph provided the foundation stones and laid them all around. And Mary said, okay, this one goes here, and this one goes here. I think Mary nurtured Jesus' faith. She helped him make sense of the big stones, of what it means to be a believer in Yahweh. I think she developed his faith. She nurtured his faith. She used her personal faith journey to help him on his personal faith journey. Grandparents, you have the greatest influence, you are the greatest single influence on your grandchildren's lives. More than their parents. You only get them for a little minutes. Very brief flashes. But in those flashes, I promise you, according to history, according to social science, according to everything that we know, you have an amazing influence on your grandchildren. And if you demonstrate to them unconditional love, and you talk about God, and you talk about Jesus, and you talk about church, and you demonstrate that in your life, they are going to always remember that. I had one grandfather who testified to Jesus to the minute he died. I had another father, grandfather who didn't, who never confessed until the minute before he died. We have a powerful influence on our children. We need to nurture their faith. We need to nurture the faith of our grandchildren. We need to nurture the faith of our loved ones. Number three, the third way that Mary's relationship with Jesus influenced him is in the, in the area of human relationships. Okay? This is a question for the husbands in the room. Who is better at relating to the people in your lives? You or your wife? Who has more connections, more understanding, who spends more time talking to other people, you or your wife? There's a genetic default somewhere in us guys. Give us 
you know, politics or war or sports, and we'll talk all afternoon. Ask us to talk about our feelings, and we're going to go. Uh, okay. What else do you want to know? We, as men, have a natural inclination not to be empathetic. You know, oh, you're, you're feeling? Oh, you hurt? Oh. Our, our, our oldest son has fallen deeply head over heels in love, and the second or third week that they were dating, she had a traffic accident in D.C., a very serious one. And she called him up to tell him about it, he was like, yeah, okay, all right, and, oh, yeah, okay. Your tire is car's total. oh, okay. Didn't occur to him to say, are you okay? How do you feel about that? She wouldn't talk to him for 12 hours. He couldn't figure out what he'd done. We aren't naturally empathetic. Men, we have to be taught how to be empathetic. And who is the person who, is the person who has the greatest influence on us, on us growing up about how to relate to other human beings? I would suggest to you it's mom and possibly grandma. Mary helped Jesus understand what it was to be empathetic to human beings. He didn't come out of the box empathetic. He's a man, like you and me, or me and the guys. Every time Jesus, empathy, somebody needs to be teaching our children and our grandchildren and the public empathy. And finally, fourth and last, I think Mary taught Jesus what it meant to live sacrificially. If you're a first century woman, if you're, if you're a first century wife, a 14-year-old married to a 35-year-old, you are going to live sacrificially, culturally. It's just going to happen. It has to be. We are not born with an inclination towards sacrifice, or another way of saying the same thing, generosity or giving. I believe that Jesus was taught about sacrificial living by his mother Mary. All right. So we learned about Joseph last week. We're learning about Mary this week. Joseph taught Jesus what it meant to be a Jew, to well, who God was, and the basis, gave him the basis of his faith. But Mary nurtured that faith. Mary taught him that he was the Son of God. Mary taught him what it meant to love other people. I just sum it up as briefly as I can. Joseph gave Jesus, taught Jesus love and obedience, and Mary taught him empathy, faith, and sacrifice. If we want our children and our grandchildren to develop into God-fearing, Jesus-believing adults, gentlemen, you need to be a God-fearing, Jesus-believing example. Mothers, if you want your children to develop into solid adults who have empathy for others, you need to have empathy for others. Fathers, if you want your children to be law-abiding, to be contributing members to society, you need to be law-abiding, contributing members of society, and I'm talking about the speed limit and tax preparation and everything else. Others, if you want your children to live out their lives believing in God, giving away their lives to others, you need to teach them empathy, nurture their faith, and teach them how to live sacrificially. We cannot expect our children and our grandchildren to become what they've never seen the most important thing I have to say to you today. We cannot expect our children and our grandchildren to become what they never see. Oh, well, I'll tell them about it. I'll tell them about God. Whatever you tell them about will go in this year and out that year. And who you are is what you're going to see when they grow up. And I can testify to that. We cannot expect our children and our grandchildren to become what they never see. What do we need them to see? We need to teach them to love and obey God. We need to show them that they are something special, created uniquely for a unique purpose. We need to nurture their faith. We need to teach them empathy. And we need to teach them that life is not all about them. It's about giving to others and making life better for the people around you through your belief in Jesus Christ. May the lessons of Mary penetrate our hearts. How are your children? What are your children being taught? What are your grandchildren being shown?
Holy Father, thank you for the lessons of Mary and Joseph and, and how their relationship shaped Jesus to be your son and to accept his responsibility to be what he cre was created to be, which is the Savior of the world. May we grasp that each of us are created specially by you for a purpose. There are no accidents when it comes to human life. No matter how that life came to be, it is part of your plan that that life came to be in existence. May we come to a point where we accept that we are unique created people with a divine purpose. And may the mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers of the lives that you give us be nurtured, taught, taught to love, taught to obey, taught about you, taught about Jesus, and shown what all that means. May this not just be another Christmas season, but may this be the season of change when we understand our vertical relationship determines our horizontal relationships and our horizontal relationships can change eternal destinies. These things I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last carol with him, please.